ko te reo reo a kia ki uta, ko te whakataki mai a tōrua ki tai, he kōtuku ki te raki, he kākapo ki te whinua. The voice of the kia is heard inland, the cry of the albatross is heard at sea, a white heron in the sky, a kākapo on the ground. 80% of our birds, of our endemic birds, are, are in trouble. And that's a higher proportion than any other country that I can think of. And so we have huge tracts of forests that are just silent. You know, New Zealand birds are part of our national identity. As far as I'm aware, we are the only country in the world where people are known colloquially by a bird name. We're, we're called Kiwis. They're just part of our national identity and people come from all over the world to see our New Zealand birds. So birds are, for most New Zealanders, their bridge to the natural world. So birds are inherently important you know, the, so many of our bird species are found only here. If we lose them here, they're lost to the world forever. But they are also critically the way that conservationists can best talk to the wider New Zealand public about what's at stake, why it's important to protect these places, and what they can do about that. I think uh, there's a big push to, to try to help our na native birds because we've realised uh, you know, just what we've lost, you know, the number of uh, species that have gone extinct since human contact about 800 years ago is, is unfortunately terribly long. There is a huge awareness now about the situation, the biodiversity crisis, I guess, that is affecting our native birds. And we've seen the decline of our native species for quite a few years now, and it's becoming quite dire. Everywhere you look, some of the birds that we assume are, are, are good, are important, the birds that describe us, they're in trouble. You know, this thing that you really care about, nature, is under severe threat. It's not being well managed and we're going to lose it unless we all take urgent action. New Zealand has become um, a desert in a lot of places of green grass, and number eight wire. And that is not a, <coughs> a broad ranging habitat for most of our species. Might be good for introduced Australian uh, spur wing plovers, uh, but it's not so good for pigeons and tuis um, and bellbirds. It sort of crystallises New Zealand's conservation challenges to keep what's unique to New Zealand and what we give to the world as our unique contribution to that avian biodiversity. And so that is a really hard fact, is that um, New Zealand's got a huge way to go to get its um, endemic birds back into those landscapes. You know, overwhelmingly introduced predators have been the main problem for New Zealand birds and that's why we've lost so many species since, uh, well, over the last thousand years really, we've lost more than 55 species since first human contact in New Zealand. Obviously I come from predator free, so I'm a little bit biased, but pred predators are a huge one, introduced predators, and then obviously there's loss of habitat, and there's stuff, there's stuff humans do also. You know, we um, have the highest cat ownership rate in, um, in the developed world, we're actually in the world. So, so threatening to New Zealand bird life, but also we've got climate change coming up, such a huge one for our coastal species, and even it's increasing the rat numbers in forests because the cold forests are now getting warmer, so increasing the rat prevalence in forests and mast years that just threaten our New Zealand birds. Um, and people as well, you know, people who let their cats outside and people who drive four-wheel drives along riverbeds, so threatening to those species that just, they, they require that area to survive. Most New Zealand birds evolved in an ecosystem dominated by other birds. These birds are, are really facing uh, a, war, a war of attrition with, with mammalian predators all the time. 
it is fantastic to see the, the wave of enthusiasm that, that New Zealanders have picked up Predator Free 2050 as, as a goal with. Um, but there is a very long way to go and a, an enormous uh, amount of work to be done. So the announcement of Predator Free New Zealand is one of those great aspirational goals. As Paul Callahan said, it's our moonshot. So it's really starting to roll out around the country. Community groups everywhere, people in their backyards, they're all putting traps out and actually starting to harvest rats, stoats and possums. Yeah, well, the thing about the Predator Free 2050 vision is that the recipe isn't that radical. You know, it's, um, it's re reduce or eliminate th uh, the predators um, that are um, slowly forcing our um, native species towards extinction and give them enough habitat and food uh, to survive in. Forest cover matters for forest birds, which doesn't sound surprising, but it's a really important point to bear in mind when we're thinking about a predator-free New Zealand, because um, these birds are going to care where you do your pest control because they need habitat as well. So we're not, we're not gaining more habitat right now, we're losing it. Um, and for the, those of us who care for the natural world, you know, who love these things, who love nature and, and want to see it protected, we're losing. So Birds New Zealand is a volunteer driven science organisation dedicated to the study and research of birds. So the key objective is to collect bird observational data that helps make conservation management decisions, particularly relating to habitat restoration and predator control. Yeah, so the City Birds New Zealand is uh, a volunteer organisation. It's driven by science uh, and uh, birds are obviously the, the most critical thing of what they're, what they're reviewing, but they're very much driven also by the ecology, by the environment, and by conservation. And those are all values that are pretty close to my wife and I's heart. So my wife, Glenys, and I uh, own uh, FSL Foods. Uh, FSL Foods is a national distributor of fruits uh, and has been a sponsor for the last four years of uh, New Zealand, uh, Birds New Zealand, uh, to the tune of about $120,000. So because of that generous donation from Goodness Kitchen, Birds New Zealand is in a fantastic position to run the country's largest ever citizen science project. The overarching ethos of this scheme is to do better for our birds so that the information we collect can be used to make better decisions for them. Um, it's accepted as a fact that you can't manage what you don't measure. So we need, we need data. We need to know how many of, of a particular species there are and where they are. Because unless we know that, um, how will we know whether an intervention that we make to try and improve things for that species or for that ecosystem has worked, not worked, or been damaging even? Citizen science is really important because of um, the sheer volume of data that we can collect. And I think if you think of the agencies like DOC or councils, um, even community groups, monitoring is something that is time consuming and quite hard to do. And often those volunteers at community groups want to be going and clearing the traps and doing something on the ground that they've got a list of jobs and monitoring often falls off the end. Really the only way that we can get accurate information on New Zealand birds over the whole breadth of the country is by getting lots of people out there recording what they see and even more importantly what they don't see. The Atlas is really the biggest um, I think citizen science project in New Zealand. It involves um, people from the Ornithological Society of New Zealand or Birds New Zealand and others um, in collecting information about what birds are where. And there's been two atlases, one um, in the 1970s, 1969 to 1979, and the second one, 1999 to 2005. So they're periodic assessments of New Zealand's um, bird distribution. So the third Birds New Zealand Atlas project starts today, June 1st, 2019, and it'll be running for the next five years. So the New Zealand Bird Atlas is this incredibly ambitious project 
basically what we've set, the, the task that we've set ourselves is to map the distribution of birds across the entire country over a five year period. And the way we've kind of chopped that job up is that we um, have broken the country up into 10 by 10 kilometre grid squares, there's over 3,000 of them. And over the next five years we want to visit each of those grid squares in each of the four seasons at least once and do a thorough survey of all of the bird species present in, in each of those grid squares. Yeah, well, the Atlas is a great way for, um, to get a lot of people involved in um, you know, studying New Zealand birds and, and recording what's happening. And we've seen you know, big changes between the first two atlases and you know, we're another uh, almost 20 years on since the last atlas, so uh, we're going to get more, more change, no doubt. So the bird atlas will be really helpful in terms of monitoring bird distribution and also um, frequency of um, bird sightings after, especially after a, um, the mast event, um, after 1080 drops, that we've, we've seen some of those harder to monitor species. I know DOC will be doing some monitoring, but actually the more data that we can collect, the better. So we know that in areas where DOC doesn't have the resource to do a 1080 drop or to, to do any monitoring, that um, we've got the citizens doing that monitoring for us and capturing that data, and that's Im immensely valuable when you think how under-resourced DOC is, um, that's hopefully improving, but we, um, we kind of need all, ha all hands on deck. Yeah, well, now we're entering our third atlas, um, it'll be really interesting to compare back to the previous two atlases as to you know, what species um, distribution changes there have been. Um, and you know, that will hopefully give a lot of positive feedback to the community groups who have been doing all the work to, to try to maintain um, bird populations in their area. It's, it's absolutely crucial to our, our um, government agencies, local governments, planning you know, rules around land use, uh, changes in water abstraction, for example, just having that data set of how our birds have responded to past changes can give us a great insight to what will happen if we continue with a lesser fair approach to, to water abstraction and irrigation and just continual you know, changes to our rural landscape. So I see the Atlas um, as playing quite a big role in helping us with species threat lists. So that is one of the more powerful things we've done recently, gone through just for our region about what's threatened and then you can actually go, well, this thing really needs looking after here. So not only will the Atlas inform that, but it'll also help us about where those things are. So to me, that's a key for conservation that we need to be way more focused and I think the Atlas will provide us with that. One of the most amazing things out of the last atlas was the fact that uh, Susan Walker and Adrian Monks of Landcare Research could take the data that had been collected by citizen scientists and do sophisticated statistical modelling on it and actually draw national patterns about what was going on with New Zealand birds between the two atlases. I really started to get interested in the atlases because I'm, I'm basically a plant ecologist by training but I've always been very interested in big patterns of of change and very involved in land use change in the inland South Island and I'd noticed that dotrels in the central Otago area were being replaced by sparrows and thought that the atlas may be able to provide some insights into the big scale patterns and, um, and so we started analysing the data um, and of course we started fitting models to one or two birds and looking at their distributions and then we might as well do them for the rest. and. Um, what came out of that is when I just, you know, realised that it had such huge potential to tell us not only about the birds that I was initially interested in, but especially um, the forest birds and um, just the patterns were so stark and they were so distressing and so clear and I just thought, wow, you know, this is such an important story in these atlases that's just sitting here and I don't think I had appreciated and I'm sure that not many people had really sort of seen that stark evidence of that huge wide decline in endemic forest birds across those two and a half decades. Yeah, well the previous two Atlas projects, particularly with the way that they are analysed in relation to land cover, so the for extent of forest, has shown quite clearly that a lot of our deep endemic birds are increasingly disappearing from the front country. So you have to go to our cold highland forests you know, in the South Island to see a lot of our native forest birds that should have been everywhere originally. So we sort of think nowadays 
of species like robin and kakariki and rifleman as being high altitude beach forest birds, but that wasn't the case in the past. They were right through all our lowland forests. And it's really just a reflection of where the predator communities have allowed those birds to persist. And it's these atlas projects are the way that we get the, that kind of insight to what's happening with New Zealand landscapes and the predators that are impacting on our native birds. Bird declines in New Zealand are something like a conveyor belt. So we know we've got really threatened iconic species like kakapo, which are really in need of conservation attention and there are a lot of sort of good news stories about we've actually rescued a number of birds so I suppose since humans arrived birds have been going extinct in New Zealand and something has changed in the last 50 years and that birds have not been going extinct but what the atlas tells us is that um, what has happened is just really at that bottom of the cliff and so we have managed to stop birds going extinct once they become um, really depleted, their populations are small, we can scrape them up, put them on islands, do intensive rescue efforts and stop them from going extinct. But in the meanwhile, other birds are actually moving down that slippery slope into that state. And so New Zealand um, has been, I think, a fantastic model um, for these really intensive rescue efforts. But um, what is happening is that that conveyor belt is still going and so the real challenge for New Zealand is to stop that and so what needs to happen is for us to move our conservation efforts from um, that really intensive rescue mode if we can and start doing more landscape scale conservation that stops those populations that are still large becoming smaller and I think it's something that without the atlases you wouldn't be able to see necessarily because it takes that amount of citizen science, that real big spatial effort and, and that national picture to really put that together. And then the other group that is in deep trouble is um, our inland breeding migrants, so internal migrants. These are wading birds, terns and gulls that go and feed on the coast in winter but often return to the inland South Island basins to breed on the ground in the spring where they, they face a suite of predators and these days they're facing huge land use change as well. And so our analyses showed that both of those things are contributing to those declines. I'm absolutely delighted that um, the society is taking on a third atlas. I think it's just absolutely awesome um, because it's such an important data set and it's such an important effort. I think it speaks volumes about, you know, the um, dedication of people in the society but also that dedication to making a contribution for New Zealand's birds and I think it's really important scientifically as well and for our knowledge and our ability to conserve birds and um, I think it's probably the premier New Zealand biodiversity database and um, I think it's just so great that it's going to be happening again. So this is a call to arms for us birders. All of us can make a con contribution. It doesn't matter how big or how small. Everybody's con contribution is important and we need them all. Yeah, I think you know, each, each individual can make a, a, a big contribution, uh, no matter how many uh, you know, Atlas squares you cover. Um, e every little bit adds to the jigsaw and, and collectively uh, we've seen you know, that a small organisation like OSNZ, now Birds New Zealand, you know, as a small organisation can make a huge contribution to New Zealand conservation through gathering that, you know, factual data about what the distribution of birds are. If people were out there looking at birds or just going for a bush walk or whatever, then recording that data is so valuable because you're helping um, those groups get the feedback that they need and the results, show them the results that they're getting from their trapping or from their predator control. and. Um, otherwise they wouldn't capture that data and, and data gives us lots of things. It, it motivates that group to keep going because they know that the kōkako are successfully breeding or that they've got more um, pairs of fio or what, whatever, whatever the um, bird species that are around. But there's a huge chunk of rural New Zealand in particular that just gets missed because most of our bird watchers are urban dwellers just in terms of, of proportion of population. And so it tends to be just a few localities near our main cities and towns that bird watchers tend to go to. 
And then there's the back country that's either the Great Walks or Department of Conservation monitoring. But there's all that rural land which makes up the bulk of New Zealand that gets missed unless we have a scheme like this to give some structure and encouragement to as many keen bird watchers as possible to get out there and record what is going on in New Zealand's rural landscape. So you think about it, if we don't know where the problems are, where, where our birds are declining most rapidly, in which habitats, which parts of the country, we're putting ourselves in a really poor position for when it comes to responding to those problems. We're, we're literally working blind. My name is Ian Davies and I'm the eBird Project Coordinator here at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And I'm really excited to be working with uh, our collaborators at Birds New Zealand over the next five years on the New Zealand Bird Atlas. So at eBird and here at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, we're really excited to provide a platform for folks around the world to monitor birds, understand the world around them, and use that information to inform conservation. So in New Zealand particularly, we're really excited to work with Birds New Zealand, um, just an incredible partner there who we've been working with for over 12 years. And over that time, New Zealand eBirders have contributed more than one and a half million sightings of birds from across the country. And so our partnership began in 2008, where New Zealand was actually the first country in the world outside of the Americas to use eBird. And we're really excited to take this to the next level with the New Zealand Bird Atlas. Yeah, there's a, a few advantages of eBird over other systems, which include just writing things in your own notebook. Um, the first advantage is it's really easy to use. So they've greatly improved it over, over the years, but it's a really quick and easy way to get all of your observations from a, a day out or what's happening in your own garden recorded quickly and efficiently. We're really excited to use eBird for the New Zealand Bird Atlas because we want to make it as easy and fun as possible for you to go out and report what you've seen. So the free eBird mobile app allows you to take eBird in your pocket wherever you go and log whatever you see wherever you go. I think it's really cool, the whole fact of it being on an app and that it can be, you can actually make it the point of your walk if you're going for a walk with friends or family and you can say, okay, well, let's count, you're in charge of counting how many two we see and you're in charge of the kaka and you're in charge of the tiaki. And I think the Atlas is going to be a good way for young people to get involved in conservation, especially with the new way of it being through the eBird smartphone app, that makes it much easier and much more accessible for people to submit data to this project. At eBird, our primary goal is really to give back to the birds we all care about. And so here, at the end of the day, we really want to impact bird conservation. So to date, eBird data have been used in more than 250 peer-reviewed papers. Uh, they've been used by governments and local organizations to uh, conserve properties, to list species as endangered, and also to give back to the birding communities that power all of this information. Yes, we've seen you know, major changes in technology and you know, this time around in the electronic era, there'll be much more immediate feedback to, to observers. I remember back in the first atlas, uh, there was a provisional atlas produced about halfway through and that provided a great spur for people to go out to areas which hadn't been covered previously. Um, and so you could see you know, what squares had been covered and which ones hadn't been covered. And, but we'll, we'll get that much more immediately and um, so we'll have a continuous spur of of you know, showing where the data is missing from, so hopefully that will get people out and about into sort of places they wouldn't normally go. I'm thrilled that eBird is being used. It's a, it's a really easy interface. A lot of forest and birders, of course, are already using eBird, and so actually being able to just contribute to the Atlas by doing something you're already doing um, makes it super easy, and, and I'd encourage everyone to give it a go. So in terms of being able to provide a tool to our Atlas participants that they can very quickly just jump onto and, and start using to collect data as part of the Atlas project, it's, it's, it's already there, it's ready to go. We, we didn't have to invent something from, from scratch. The other reason is that there's a, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology have done some very clever things behind the scenes to structure the, the database in which our Atlas data will be held in such a way that it's, it's already almost perfectly set up for an Atlas data set. So again, rather than us going out and reinventing the wheel, it made a huge, huge sense for us, a very small volunteer organisation, just to, to take this, this tool that already exists and, and make use of it. Previous two Atlases that were run in previous decades, 
we had to train up our ATLAS participants from scratch. So they, we started from a standing start. We had to give them the method and a, a data sheets and teach them from scratch how to go out in ATLAS. One huge advantage that eBird gives us now is that eBird has been running in New Zealand for about 15 years. We have a, what we're calling a standing army of three or 400 people already pre-trained to use eBird in exactly the way we'd like them to use it for the Atlas. So it gives us this enormous advantage. We've got this running start this time round that we've got hundreds of people already primed to go out from day one and start participating in our Atlas. So one of the, one of the key uh, methods for people to submit their data to the New Zealand Bird Atlas is to use the eBird mobile app, which means when they're out atlasing, out in the field collecting Atlas data, they can fire up the eBird mobile app on their phone and enter their data as they collect it. It's a one-step process, so instead of having to write the data down into your notebook, then go home and enter it into the website and hit submit or fill out a data sheet and, and post it in, you're doing it straight onto your phone and hitting submit then and there and it goes straight into the New Zealand Bird Atlas database. Most mobile phones these days have built-in GPS units so the phone knows where it is so it records its location for you. You don't have to be looking up a map and reading off coordinates and running the risk of writing down the wrong coordinate or, or misreading where you are. Uh, the phone, your phone of course also knows things like the date and the times so that's automatically entered into your checklist for you. It would have been nice on a number of occasions over the past 40 years to have had that sort of technology at your fingertips. It was sometimes quite difficult determining what square you were in even. All you have to do as the observer actually is focus on the birds that you are seeing around you and recording the birds that you see as accurately as you can, um, which is really the, 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 the crux of the project and what everybody's in it for. So to ensure we've got good coverage across the entire country, we've divided it into over 3,000 10 by 10 kilometre squares. But the great thing is, is the individual birder can pick where he or she wants to go. You can go to your favourite patch or somewhere brand new. You get to choose. So the thing that's most important though, is within each of those 10 by 10 squares, you survey each habitat that's in there. We need complete checklists from each of those. So if you're walking across a paddock towards a, forest, a, a patch of forest, you record, you, you do a check, complete checklist in the farmland first. When you leave the farm, go into the forest, you start a new checklist there recording all of the birds in the forest. And remember, they need to be complete checklists. So that's a list of every bird that you're able to identify. Yeah, something that we really have to encourage as part of this Atlas scheme is for people to submit full lists. And that means focusing on the species that we easily overlook, like house sparrows and red-billed gulls, you know, the common species, particularly the introduced species, tend to not get as much attention because most of us are much more interested in our deep endemic birds and we get really excited if we see a rare vagrant. And so it's very tempting to just put in a, a part list with just the three or four species that caught your attention. But unfortunately those data sets are of limited value to researchers because if you want to look at things like how often does this species get recorded at this locality, you have to ignore all of those part lists. They do not give you any information about the likelihood of a species occurring there because unless you've got a full list, uh, you cannot analyse presence absence, you know, percentage occurrence. And so it's really important as part of the Atlas scheme that we make an effort to complete those full lists. That's the important thing, that it's not just the uncommon and it's not just the natives, because a lot of the ref our habitat changes are reflected very much among a variety of birds. The huge advantage that complete bird checklists give, gives us is that we can, it, it, it opens the door to using statistical methods to estimate the probability of detecting a bird in a particular location or habitat, irrespective of whether any of our observers actually observed it there when they were out atlasing. So we can basically paper over all the gaps with robust estimates of whether a particular species are likely to occur there. So that means these, these maps will be complete, there will be no gaps, and there will be no biases in terms of distribution of search effort or 
distribution and the expertise of observers. So, you know, if you have an observer that, ha a very competent, very experienced observer that happens to work in one region and perhaps a less experienced person in another region, we can account for that difference in skill level um, uh, and produce maps that are not biased with respect to that skill. We can only do that, we can only produce these unbiased and complete maps if our data is structured into complete checklists. So they really are the, the, the gold standard that we all need to be aiming for. And whatever you do, do not forget that every individual observation contributes to the whole. A grain of sand on the beach means little. An observation of one bird, unless it's extremely endangered, also means little on its own. Everything you add to that observation improves it. But it its presence at a time of year, its presence at a particular locality, its presence in a certain type of habitat, and even its behaviour, is it breeding or otherwise. All of those things add to your observation. It's not just a case of, ah, oh, well, I've ticked off another species in my tick list without any additional information. So this is our challenge. We need to rise to it. The earth is at a tipping point, and here's our chance to help. The last thing we want is somebody sitting back and thinking, well, I, I'm, I'm not as good as this person over here, so I, I, I better not participate in the atlas. It's, it's absolutely not a problem. We want as many people as possible participating in this project. It's, it's really it's the ultimate excuse to go birding, basically, and, and bird wherever you want to. And wherever you choose to go, whichever squares you choose to cover, whether it's your back garden or or, or the, the South Island high country, um, you are making an equally valuable contribution to this, this really ambitious project. So pumped for the Atlas, really. It's, it's going to be, I've heard stories from people that have been involved in the last two Atlases and the pleasure of checking off just squares in the Atlas and all of that kind of thing. So no, I'm super excited to be involved in it. And it's, it's such an important conservation tool to be involved in as well. So the more pairs of eyes that we have and more pairs of ears we have, uh, looking out for and listening for, for birds and actually entering data, contributing to this atlas, the better it's going to be. You know, the, and, and we need the atlas to be as comprehensive and as thorough as it can possibly be, and the way to achieve that will be through as many people as possible contributing. You know, the two previous atlas projects have actually been a really good way to make the society have a higher profile among the people who have a broader interest in New Zealand natural, natural environment. So the previous Atlas projects made a real effort to engage with tramping clubs and mountaineers, people who'd be going into the backcountry. And unfortunately that momentum got lost after each of those Atlas projects. You know, a lot of people contributed to those and really that was their extent of involvement with the society. And so this is, is really an opportunity to re-engage with people who just have a general interest in New Zealand natural ecosystems, wildlife in general, get them focused on something that has a definite outcome. And for those who have a, a particular interest in birds or who foster that through this project, then hopefully as a society we can capture more of their imaginations and get them along to our meetings and participating in other schemes and just keep that momentum going. The next five years we're set on getting as many people involved as we can. This project is larger than Birds New Zealand and we need to get other community conservation groups involved and people from any walk of life to get involved in this project. So we need to lead from the front. We need to get as many people as possible involved in this nationally significant project. So to get started, go to the Atlas website and there's a whole lot of resources there but ultimately download the eBird app and get out there and start atlasing. We've made it as simple as could possibly be. If after all of that you have any questions just get in touch with us. So the atlas is going to be a powerful tool to move us forward and start making better decisions for restoring 
our natural ecosystems and the wildlife within them. The opportunities for everyday New Zealanders to encounter these birds when they're going out into the bush or out in their boat, boat going fishing or, or walking on the beach uh, is, is diminishing by, literally by the day. So if, if we can't halt these declines and turn them around, we are facing a situation where only a select few New Zealanders that have access to sites such as offshore islands and Zealandia and can get themselves out into the remote, most remote parts of Fiord and only those people will be in the privileged positions of encountering some of our most remarkable wildlife. I think the Atlas is a good example of where it's a project that everyone can buy into and everyone can contribute to but it also has some serious scientific gains so the Atlas everyone can submit a checklist through the eBird app it's easy it takes a minute um, but that checklist will really really benefit conservation because it gives a it's part of a bigger picture that allows us to see what the what the state of New Zealand's bird life is in a way that we haven't before or in the last 20 years at least we haven't seen so it, it's so important and it bridges the gap between just regular people and scientists and conservation workers on the ground so well because it's something that everyone can buy into. Yeah and I'm, I'm confident that the work that's been done to design this is going to um, make it a really good project. I think that the use of technology is going to take away a lot of barriers for people to actually just get things going. I think that with young people in their phones, the ability to use cell technology to enter data is going to inspire young people to want to get involved in this. This, this is going to be um, the world that they live in and I think that these attributes all come together to make a scheme that's going to give us really strong national coverage um, and really good data in, in three or four or five years time. I think maybe the, the bigger picture point to make is that not so long ago conservation was something that happened elsewhere you know it was um, uh, happened on southwest Fiordland or on Kapiti Island whereas now it's happening you know in the city in our backyards and I think tools like backyard traps social media stuff like the bird atlas enables us as citizens to be, to take it to be involved and to make a difference and it lets all of us know that each little bit that we're doing is enabling us to, you know, be in a place like this with Tui chortling away and having to dodge kaka and things on the tracks. So, yeah. You know, this atlas is something that I, that I am really looking forward to, really encouraging all forest and birders and as many other conservationists as possible to be involved in contributing to. If we are successful and we manage to map the occupancy of birds across the entire country over the next five years, then we're going to be able to we're going to create this data set that's going to inform conservation action at national, regional and local scales. That data will be used for that purpose for decades to come. It, it's really going to have an enormous impact on how we do conservation in New Zealand. So my team and I are immensely excited about the new Atlas project project and we can't wait to get out there and atlasing and ultimately it's you participants that we need to make sure this is successful. So everything's ready, all we need is you to get out there and get atlasing and we can't wait for the data to be pouring in. <laughs>